Legislative Forum uh, featuring the candidates from Kansas House of Representatives District 20 today, uh, which is parts of Leewood and Overland Park. I'm Stephanie Meyer, the um, brand new three-day-in uh, CEO of the Leewood Chamber, so still getting used to that as well. So uh, excited to be here. Uh, politics has been my passion for a number of years, so I love this part of the job and appreciate both of you for everything you do for the community and for stepping forward to run. So appreciative of that. And uh, that's really it for me. I want to turn things over to our legislative tax task force chair, uh, Molly Hayes, who is also the director of advocacy for Advent Health. And she'll be leading the conversation today. Thank you. And wearing the appropriate clothing. Yeah. <laughs> Matching. <laughs> Didn't get that at all. I know. Well, well, like she said, I'm Molly Hayes. Thank you guys so much for agreeing to run and agreeing to participate in our chamber forum. On behalf of the Johnson County Public Policy Chamber, as you can see on the screen, we all work together to get the word out and collaborate on votejoco.com. It's an effort of 10 chambers, represent more than 5,000 Johnson County businesses. In addition to these forums, the Public Policy Council conducts voter education efforts, including publishing a wealth of candidate information on the council's website. So again, it's votejoco.com, and you can go on there to see the video of this and, and interviews and um, candidate questionnaires. Couldn't think of the word. <laughs> okay, so welcome and introduce. We're going to welcome and introduce our candidates. Mary Lynn Poskin, right here, is the owner of KC College Connect and a member of the Independent Education Consultants Association as an education consultant. She lives in Leewood and was elected to represent the 20th House District in 2020. Outside of work and serving in the Kansas Legislature currently, Mary Lynn has been involved in the National MS Society, KC Scholars, and Kansas Teacher of the Year Committee. Um, Carrie Raffel, Raffel, it, it's a tough one. Uh, Carrie Raffel <laughs> is a preparer professional in the Blue Valley School District where her children attend. She has served as co-president of the Lewis Elementary PTO and special and member of the Special Education Advisory Committee for Blue Valley. She and her husband are small business owners. Thank you both for being here today. I want to introduce Kevin Walker with the Overland Park Chamber, who's going to help be our timekeeper today. We um, drew a number randomly to see who would go first, which will be Mary Lynn. <laughs> um, each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. After opening comments, we'll rotate through questions that were written by the Public Policy Council to get through as many questions as time allows. We'll keep right on the time limits. You'll have two minutes to answer each question, and we will not be taking questions from the audience today. Because this is a forum and not a debate, we have not built in time for rebuttal. At the conclusion of our Q&A, we'll give each candidate one minute for closing remarks. Okay, we will begin with Mary Lynn and her opening statement. Ready? Thank you so much, Molly. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Representative Mary Lynn Poskin. Thanks to the Public Policy Council for this opportunity to help inform our District 20 voters about their state representative candidates. There are critically important differences each of us bring to our campaigns and to the work we would do on your behalf in the legislature. Like many of us, I'm a Kansan by choice. My father was a colonel in the Air Force, and I spent my early adult life relocating corporately across the country. When 9-11 happened, I knew we needed to put down permanent roots for our family. We could have picked anywhere in the country, and we picked Kansas for the outstanding public schools, safe and healthy communities, and vibrant economic opportunities like the opening of the Sheraton at the Convention Center. Kudos, by the way, to the Convention Center in the heart of District 20 for being named Best Small Convention Center in North America, and to the cities of Overland Park and Leewood for consistently earning rankings as a best place to live. I'm the mom of a blended family of seven children, a higher education professional for over 20 years, and a small business owner, and have served my community in myriad volunteer positions over the years. In 2020, I ran as the high energy champion for District 20 values, and I delivered. I forged great relationships across the aisle, co-sponsored bipartisan legislation, and brought real results back to the district. In particular, I was the only legislature to originate original legislation to combat the teacher shortage and get it across the finish line. I earned a leadership position on the Transportation and Public Safety Budget Committee in my first term, critical to our infrastructure and helping to bring the KDOT cost share partnership with the City of Leewood to create the Indian Creek Trail Connector to Town Center, increasing business opportunities and public safety. I was recognized as an emerging leader 
in the Midwest by the bipartisan council of state governments. It's been the honor of a lifetime to serve District 20, fighting for its common sense centrist values. I look forward to earning your support again in 2020. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, now, Carrie, we'll have you make your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you to the Johnson County Public Policy Council at Overland Park Chamber for hosting us today. Thank you, Mary Lynn, for being here too. My name is Carrie Rayfelt and I live in Leewood. My husband and I chose to move here about nine years ago for the many reasons that a lot of people do. The great schools, the safe and friendly neighborhoods, and a thriving economy that offers lots of opportunity. We love raising our family here. I'm running because I think we need to put aside partisan politics and have more young moms with a place at the table helping to craft the policies that affect our families, our community, our businesses, and our everyday lives. I'm a political outsider and my diverse professional background enables me to be an experienced advocate on both healthcare and education. Additionally, my experience in helping operate our family-owned restaurant franchises gives me the unique ability to understand the challenges our local businesses see every single day. My husband Matt and I have three boys, ages 13, 11, and 8, who all attend Blue Valley Public Schools and I work as a special education parent in the district. I've also served as our elementary school PTO president and a member of the Special Education Advisory Council. I was at a PTO meeting when our principal was talking about staffing shortages in our school. I jumped in head first and helped fill the need in our elementary school, first in the cafeteria and later as a para. I believe strongly in being a part of the solution and working hard to get things done, and that's the same mentality and work ethic that I'll bring to the Kansas House. I'm tired of all the partisan bickering and the lack of results from our elected officials. I'm here to be a counter to that. I'm a level-headed, respectful, and rational leader who's ready to listen to everyone and focus on long-term results for our community. My focus in Topeka will be on advocating for education and helping our K-12 schools keep our, our K-12 schools strong so our kids are ready for the workforce when they graduate. Ensuring home ownership remains affordable by ending stealth property tax increases that penalize us for maintaining and staying in our homes and lowering the cost of living by creating smart policies to help Kansans keep more of their hard-earned money in their pockets. It would be the honor, an honor to serve and represent the families of District 20. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks. And this time we'll start with Carrie answering first. So as a candidate, what are your top three policy issues? Well, I kind of just talked about those. Um, so my top three policy issues would be, um, you know, advocating for education and keeping our K through 12 schools strong, uh, so our kids are ready for the workforce when they graduate. We need them to to be ready to uh, go to college, whether it's a four-year university, uh, university um, or if they go to a community college, or if they they enter a trade. Um, I also want to ensure that home ownership remains affordable by, and that we're able to stay in our homes um, but by ending the stealth property tax increases that penalize us for maintaining um, our homes. I talk to uh, senior citizens every day when I'm out knocking on doors and I know they have a lot of concerns of, about losing their homes um, due to the property tax increases. So I want to be able to get them help with that. And then lowering the cost of living by creating smart policies to help Kansans keep more of their hard-earned money in their pockets. That's, those are all three things that I want to work for, for the people of District 20. Thank you. And Mary Lynn, we'll connect for you. What are your top three policy issues? Because they are what drew me to Kansas above all other states, and I saw firsthand their decline when state tax policies decimated our state budget and based on thousands of conversations with constituents about their top concerns, my top three policy issues are our children's public schools and higher education opportunities, safe and healthy communities, and a vibrant economic climate for Kansas. Our children's public school and our higher education opportunities are the heart of our communities and the driver of economic success in Johnson County. My seven children spent 90 years in K-12 classrooms and 62 of those were in our public schools. I worked at Johnson County Community College for almost a decade. I guess you could say I'm vested. Uh, we need to support our professional teachers, protect our school district's local control, and fully fund both general and special education. We may, must make sure that the post-secondary paths to career success and a robust workforce in all of their formats, from apprenticeships, vocational certificates, and associate degrees, 
four-year degrees and graduate degrees are affordable and accessible for students and families. We need to maintain our safe and healthy communities by funding our public safety budgets, mental health and addiction services, safe roads and infrastructures, and especially in District 20 as a border district, make sure our state laws do not make it more attractive to commit crimes here like catalytic converter thefts. We need to expand our vibrant economic climate with tax policies that are fiscally responsible, sustainable, and equitable that build on our successes in recent years. I've been a proud supporter of Governor Kelly's comprehensive economic development plan, the first since 1986, by the way, called the Kansas Framework for Growth. That gave Kansas named the Comeback Economy of the Year by CNBC in 2019 and brought record-breaking capital development to the state, even during a global pandemic. I'm here for more of that. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. What are your views on state tax policy? And be specific if you can. We'll start with Mary Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Kansas's tax policy must be reflective of its values. And you will hear me talk a lot about our District 20 values um, today. While being fiscally responsible, balanced, and predictable for a stable business environment, and to help families plan their budgets. Our human and corporate citizens count on critical services like good roads, infrastructure, education, health care, and recreation in Kansas. We must equitably balance our revenues, generally referred to as the three-legged stool approach across sales, income, and property taxes. Then we must always strive to be incredibly conscientious stewards of our tax dollars. We have a lot of opportunity here that I'm really looking forward to exploring next session. <coughs> we have the second highest food sales tax on the highest food prices in history. While we passed bipartisan legislation to reduce that over time, the majority party refused to grant immediate relief to Kansas families, instead choosing to fund their gubernatorial strategy on the backs of Kansas grocery bills. As a border district, I am particularly concerned about the impact of this delay on our grocers and Kansas dollars being spent out of state. I've been hearing a lot about property taxes at the doors this summer. In fact, in 1992, property taxes accounted for about 35% of state revenue, and it's grown to 54%, clearly out of balance. We need to revisit funding. The local ad valorem tax reduction, reduction fund is required by statute, and the statewide cap on relief program for seniors and veterans to 350,000 regardless of county median values. It's not fair to our district seniors and veterans. I'd like to point out that my opponent, while painting our legislators as bickering politicians not getting results, she recycled my 2020 opponent's talking point of ending stealth property tax and increased valuations for maintaining our homes on our website while cards in here today. The legislature actually passed Senate Bill 13 back in 2021 with a 123 to vote in the House, including my yes vote, to do just that while repealing local government lids. I don't know why she doesn't know that, but real results bipartisan property tax solutions delivered. Thank you. And Carrie, what are your views on state tax policy? Be specific as you can. Our path to eliminating the food, the food sales tax is a step in the right direction, but I'd like to see that happen even sooner. Kansans need relief now due to our ever-rising cost of living and inflation. <clears throat> as a mom and a business owner, I felt firsthand how this can impact a budget and force people to change their habits and lifestyles to accommodate. Property tax relief for seniors and, the, and increasing the property tax exemption threshold for families should be considered as well. With my background, it's probably also no surprise, I wholeheartedly support uh, public education and special education being fully funded. Maintaining and improving our roads and bridges must also be a priority. At the end of the day, it's simple. We must manage taxpayer dollars like we would our own budgets while ensuring the things we appreciate and rely on in our communities are funded correctly. Ultimately, state tax policy should be sufficient and broad-based enough to fund our schools, roads, and infrastructure, the reasons most of us chose to live here in the first place, while providing opportunities for Kansas businesses and families to flourish. However, that also must be balanced with what is financially affordable for our households. And right now, I think it's important for government to make reductions just as every Kansas family is. Thank you. What are your views on K-12 education funding and accessibility? And Carrie, we'll go to the first sure. Well, I talked about this a little bit before, but to say education and our public schools here in Johnson County are personal for me would be an understatement. 
Like I mentioned before, I work for our public schools and I have three kids that go to school there. I'll always advocate to keep our K through 12 schools strong and make sure our kids receive the outstanding education our public schools in Johnson County are known for, while supporting our teachers who give so much back to the profession. As a mom of two children in the special education department, a special education parent in the district, and a member of the special education advisory council, I support fully funding not only our public schools, but we have an obligation to fully fund special education as well. This would go a long way toward teacher recruitment and retention, not to mention addressing parish shortages that we're currently experiencing. A fully funded and staffed SPED department not only provides students in need with their appropriate services, but it allows teachers to teach all the children in the classroom more effectively and enables a less stressful environment for all. Getting more of the funding into those classrooms and to our hardworking teachers must also be a priority. Our schools are fostering our future workforce. We must ensure we are setting our kids up for success in the real world by providing them with all the quality academics our area is known for. I'm tired of our schools being used as nothing more than a political football and campaigns. It's time for our classrooms to be a no politics zone, so they're fully focused on providing the best learning environment possible for our children. Thank you. Mary Lynn, what are your views on K-12 education funding and accessibility? Without a doubt, education is District 20's number one priority. It's the major reason businesses and families choose to locate here. It reflects some of our most deeply held values. I've been a vocal supporter of fully funding our schools according to our Constitution, fully funding our special and gifted education according to existing statute, and keeping public dollars in public schools and keeping at-risk funding. I could spend a lot of time on that in agreement with all of the Chamber's <coughs> legislative priorities around schools, but let me focus on something we probably all take for granted, but is likely the most serious red flag in this race, the accreditation, the very accreditation of our schools. While we were focused on the amendment in August, two major school districts in Oklahoma had their accreditation status dropped and are a single infraction away from being unaccredited. Tulsa and Mustang Public Schools. This happened within one short year from when the Oklahoma legislature passed a so-called CRT, or Critical Race Theory Law. These districts had single infractions and the State Board of Education decided on harsher penalties than the law called for and refused to grant appeals to the district. This can happen here, too. My opponent is not publicly disclosing that she is a founding member of the local chapter of Moms for Liberty, which has gained national attention for putting bounties on teachers' heads, for trying to ban books that teach the truth in history, like this Ruby Bridges early reader, teaching members to dox teachers, and aligning with Trump Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, a featured speaker at their annual summit in July. These are not the caring, welcoming, and centrist District 20 values I know and love. Sending this ideology to the legislature is not only the antithesis of our deeply held values, it critically endangers our children's schools. Hard stop. Our next question is what types of economic development policies do you support to encourage job growth and business expansion in Kansas? And this time it's Mary Lynn first. Thank you, Molly. I will continue to provide legislative support for Governor Kelly's and the Kansas Commerce Department's framework for growth that plans for competitive business recruiting and retention incentives, higher quality jobs, and a stronger workforce. To strengthen our economy and in turn create more job growth and business expansion, we must provide opportunities for Kansans to receive an outstanding education and retain their expert skills in the Kansas workforce, particularly educators, healthcare, and engineering and technology workers. To support a growing economy, Kansas must also implement initiatives that increase availability of worksite childcare, affordable housing, and sustainable energy sources that better the environment. I'm really proud of the bipartisan work we did to bring Panasonic to Johnson County, which, by the way, we beat out Oklahoma in that process. It will be an economic driver for generations to come. As we compete for business talent, I authored original legislation, the Kansas Employee Emergency Savings Account, or KESA bill, that garnered the co-sponsorship of both the Republican chair 
and Democratic Ranking Member of the Commerce, Labor, and Economic Development Committee, along with the support of the Majority Leader to implement tax policies to provide an edge to our Kansas small businesses to recruit and retain employees, while reducing their dependence on short-term loans and increasing their financial literacy. We ran out of time to fully work the bill, but I have been promised continued support in the next session. I would encourage our District 20 small businesses to reach out to me for more detail. We would be the first state in the nation to pass such a bill. I love being an innovator. Thank you. And Carrie, next for you. What types of economic <coughs> development policies do you support to encourage job growth and business expansion? We need policies that will grow our economy by, provide, by promoting opportunity for small and large businesses and allowing them to grow and thrive by minimizing government red tape that drains time and resources. This will encourage the creation of jobs while bringing in additional revenue for our state. By offering incentives with accountability, Johnson County and the state of Kansas can become a destination for out-of-state companies looking to relocate. This is a trend that we've seen nationally where businesses are leaving big government states like California, Illinois, and New York for less restrictive and more business-friendly states like Florida, Texas, and Tennessee. Add our excellent public schools to the mix, and there's absolutely no reason Kansas shouldn't be added to that list. Thank you. Next question, big one for all employers right now. What would you do to grow and develop the state's workforce? Carrie, you'll start this one first. You know, I think there are several ways we can develop our state's workforce, but one area I see requiring specific focus is technology. Technology is radically changing the needs in the private sector and creating a clear need for talent in the market. Kansas has a great education foundation, but moving forward, STEM-related jobs will increase at a higher rate than non-STEM jobs. Since not all jobs require four-year degrees, we must identify ways to prepare our workforce for the talent supply that will be needed over the next 20 years. I fully support real-world learning opportunities, and we should also lean in on community mentorship opportunities to allow students to connect with workforce leaders around them. Programs like Blue Valley CAPS are excellent examples of bringing community business leaders and students together so the curriculum and training is focused on industry and business needs. Thank you. Mary Lynn, what would you do to grow and develop the state's work? So the foundation of a strong workforce starts first and foremost with men maintaining superb public education from pre-K through post-secondary school. Then we need to promote the available jobs to our graduates. The Promise Act Scholarship is a last dollar scholarship that reduces the cost of entering high skill, high demand jobs with the promise that recipients will work in Kansas. I was a proud uh, partner on that bill. I'm glad that we were able to pass that in a bipartisan manner. My bill to double the funding to the Kansas Teacher Service Scholarship is another example of policies that will keep our graduates employed in Kansas. Evidence-based training and support for ex-offenders to re-enter the workforce has proven effective at growing the workforce while reducing recidivism. I've been to several legislative workshops on this subject put on by the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce and would like to see more initiatives funded in our corrections budget. We need policies to help our business attract and retain employees with innovative incentives like my Kansas Employee Emergency Savings Account Bill that other states are not offering. This is particularly true as a border district. Along these lines, we need to expand Medicaid to ensure that our workforce remains healthy and able to participate. Much of the legislature has been focused on culture war issues. This does not draw business. It does not draw young people or young talent to our state. It's imperative that we maintain a welcoming Kansas for all with non-discriminatory policies to attract top-level talent. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. And Mary Lynn, you'll answer first this time. What are your, your views on the state's role with respect to ensuring access and affordability of post-secondary education? Um, I'll answer this uh, question and have remind you to keep in mind that my husband David and I have seven children who have been through college and some are pursuing postgraduate work. Um, I've worked in higher education for nearly two decades, including nine years at our crown jewel, Johnson County Community College. Post-secondary ed education needs to be accessible and affordable to any Kansan who seeks it. 
Unfortunately, the costs for such have shifted dramatically over the years from state funding to tuition revenue, which overburdens our Kansas families and students. It is unnerving to watch what is happening at Emporia State University right this moment. We need to study it closely and find out what led to the recent cuts. On August 25th, I, along with other House members and our State Treasurer, Lynn Rogers, proposed a tax package to alleviate some of the costs of obtaining higher education for Kansans, including a $150 tax rebate for educational purposes. The plan would also create a tax credit for Kansas businesses voluntarily contributing to student loan payments on behalf of employees. Talk about a, a retention and, retra and attraction uh, package. It's, it is um, modeled on a Connecticut law that would allow companies to claim a refundable 50% state tax credit for subsidizing loan repayments, and the maximum credit would be $5,250 per student per year. As well, it includes extending the deadline for contributions to the Learning Quest 529 college savings account to qualify for state income taxes on the prior tax year's income from December 31st to April 15th, much like your 401ks. I was pleased to vote to renew the Engineering Initiative Act, the Kansas Board of Regents funding, and was delighted to see the KU Cancer Center achieve NIH Comprehensive Cancer Center designation this year. I will continue to work very hard for our higher education. Thank you. Carrie, what are your views on the state's role with respect to ensuring access and affordability of post-secondary education? Well, at the root of this, the state must do its part to ensure our primary and secondary education opportunities are rock solid, second to none across the country, and accessible to all. So all Kansans have the, have the tools they need to compete in the job force. Upward mobility is something Americans have always strived for, and it's a cornerstone of the American dream. By implementing programs that encourage continued learning, whether it be a four-year uh, university, trade school, community college, community, or community mentorships, we can help ensure our Kansas graduates want to stay in our state to live and work and raise our families. Raise their families. Thank you. Next question. What do you believe the takeaways for state lawmakers should be from the COVID-19 pandemic experience? And Carrie, we'll start with you. Well, as a mom with three kids in elementary school in the March of 2020 and a small business owner, I experienced firsthand the consequences of the government picking winners and losers when it came to deeming things essential and not essential. Unfortunately, our schools were not immune to those policies, and studies are showing that our children are now burdened with some of the heaviest consequences. The National Center for Education Statistics recently released its assessment of reading and math scores for America's nine-year-old students. This year, average scores fell five points in reading and seven points in math compared with 2020. It's the largest decline in reading scores in three decades, and the first drop in math ever recorded. You can imagine the amount of stress that these declines put on our already exhausted teachers and staffs in our schools, and I see that every day. I don't pretend to have all the answers, and there's certainly no perfect solution. But God forbid this ever happens again, I will work with everyone, to, with teachers, parents, administrators, medical professionals, and those in the other party to find solutions so the children of our state are not left way behind in the power curve. Thank you. And Mary Lynn, and for you, what do you believe the takeaways for state lawmakers should be from the COVID-19 pandemic experience? <clears throat> Thank you, Molly. Boy, that was a tough one. Um, the key takeaways for state lawmakers from the COVID-19 pandemic experience is the importance of following the science when making policy decisions and understanding that the science can change rapidly when dealing with a one in a hundred year pandemic. It also reminds me of the advice my mother gave me when I worried about the big decisions that I made in life, and particularly for my children. She said, ask yourself this, upon reflection, did you make the best decision you could with the information you had at the time for the best outcomes for your children? And I believe we did. And yes, children did suffer learning setbacks, but what I'm hearing for our teachers is their incredible resilience and how quickly they are picking up from where they left off now that we're back to normal. Maintaining transparency, thorough education, and a rational perspective is critical when enacting policies that will impact the lives of 
businesses and Kansans. State lawmakers hopefully won't have to respond to a global pandemic again, but they need to do so in a fair, agile, and impartial manner that is free from the influence of political and public pressures of special interest groups. Alongside the governor and with the backing of the scientific community, state lawmakers must act in a manner that maximizes detection and treatment while minimizing disruption. On a side note, the pandemic increased one of my concerns about my opponent's state platform that states English is published state documents, resources, advertisements, media, and online material should be made available only in our official language. It frightens me to think of what would have happened if pandemic information had only been available in English and how we expect our families to recover if they only have information available. Our district has a lot of languages and a lot of different cultures represented. Thank you. Next question is, what are your views on health care policy and Medicaid expansion? And Mary Lynn, I know you touched on this, but you'll be first. All right. I might have more to say about it. Um, Medicaid expansion is both a moral and economic imperative. It would cover 150,000 hardworking Kansans in the coverage gap including 7,400 of our military veterans and family members while creating more than 23,000 Kansas jobs. By not expanding, we've kept $5.8 billion out of our own health care system and allowed rural hospitals to close, which increases costs for all of us. This is Kansas taxpayer money that could come back to our own economy instead of elsewhere. With the added incentives for the last holdout states, it is actually costing us not to expand. I toured District 20's Menorah Hospital this week, and HCA faces $136 million in uncompensated care. All of the states bordering Kansas have expanded. I've advocated for mental health parity and health insurance and increasing our state capacity to treat mental and behavioral health and provide addiction services. It is a legislative priority for all of our chambers to expand coverage to those eligible under federal law. It's past time to do this for our fellow Kansans and our healthcare industry. While my opponent promises to be an independent leader, her party platform discourages her from voting for Medicaid expansion. District 20 is the textbook example of what happens to independent leaders when they cross party leadership. And across the state, Legislators lose their leadership voices on committees and committee assignments that are valuable to properly represent their districts. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie, what are your views on health care policy and Medicaid expansion? Every Kansan should have access to affordable health care. There are countless ways to expand access, innovation, and quality of care. I'm open to supporting Medicaid expansion, but as will always be the case, I would need to see what the final details of the legislative proposal are before committing my support. I place a high priority on ensuring it's revenue neutral and doesn't rob from highways and, or education, and that it seeks to only cover those who are uninsured currently. We must also be sure we have the infrastructure to support additional beneficiaries before adding them to our system. Current Medicaid recipients often have issues seeing a provider in a timely manner. Optimal treatment options are often denied due to cost, and most doctors don't accept Medicaid patients because reimbursements are so low. Because I previously worked in healthcare, I have firsthand knowledge of many of the impediments which drive up healthcare costs, and I look forward to working on options to ensure all Kansans have affordable access to the healthcare and medications that they need. Thank you. The next question is how control over decision making sorry, how control over decision making is divided amongst the state legislature and local governments, like school boards, on issues such as tax, economic development, and education has been a matter of debate. What are your views on this issue? Carrie, you'll be first. I believe strongly in local control in most cases. Government that's closest to the people creates the best policy and city councils and school boards know their residents and communities better than anyone. That's why I believe the state should, head, should play a limited role that's reserved for ensuring rules of transparency and that basic rights and liberties are always protected. Thank you. Mary Lynn, how control over decision making is divided among the state legislature and local governments 
in school boards. On issues such as tax, economic development, and education has been a matter of debate. What are your views on this issue? Thank you, I have long believed that the smallest government entity that is closest to an issue imparts the most efficiency and responsiveness in decision making. This deep respect for local control on issues such as taxation, economic development, and education is reflected in my voting record in the Kansas legislature. You can look at that up at ksledge.org. I have seen firsthand a legislature that doesn't want to stay in its lane and makes constant attempts to widen that lane to a superhighway. The Kansas Constitution lays out legislative authority in relationship to other elected state and local officials we need to respect that. It seems the legislature talks a lot about local control unless it doesn't like what the locals want to control. Thank you. Our last question and then we'll do closing comments and Mary Lynn you'll answer first. What do you believe most distinguishes you from your opponent in this race? Uh, thank you. When I answered this question on the Johnson County Public Policy Survey back in June, my opponent had not published a website or created a social media presence, and I had not seen any other surveys from her or met her. I focused on the positives of my first term accomplishments and results for the district by saying, I offer a proven, transparent track record of votes, initiatives, and legislative leadership deeply aligned with District 20 values. I'm constituent-centered while focusing on centrist and common sense solutions. But it was a compare and contrast question, so I had to make a statement about my opponent, which I wrote, to date, my opponent had not published a campaign website or social media presence, perhaps indicating a lack of preparation and or transparency. Three months later, I believe I hit the nail on the head with that original observation. It's tough to choose three priorities for walk cards and forums, and she chose one that had already been fully addressed by the legislature back in 2021 perhaps proving that lack of preparation. She chose to highlight the increases in grocery prices, perhaps unaware that her party was the reason for the delay in relief on that. And the legislature's support for Framework for Growth is helping to position Kansas as an answer to the supply chain issues that are putting inflationary pressure on prices. We are bringing advanced manufacturing, logistics, and warehousing right here to the Sunflower State. Most importantly, she is trying to position herself as a moderate who will work across the aisle but is hiding associations with groups that are clearly extremist and counter aligned with District 20's very, very purple and centrist values. Can we afford these types of surprises in our legislature? Thank you. Carrie, what do you believe most distinguishes you from your opponent in this race? Well, I think we've seen a lot of it today. We're, we're, we're very different. Um, I'm a political outsider who got involved in the process because I think we can do better for the people of District 20. I have a history of working with everyone to get things done in the many leadership roles that I've held. My opponent claims to be a centrist, but she has a voting record and it says otherwise. In 2022, she voted with the House Democrats 97% of the time tying her for the seventh most partisan among all Kansas Democrats. Certainly not the bipartisan narrative that she sells. She voted against common sense legislation, including term limits requiring school districts to provide full-time in-person attendance for all students. She voted against work requirements for welfare benefits and against providing short-term health care plans. She's so extreme that she even opposed multiple pieces of legislation signed into law by Governor Laura Kelly. I'm here to put people before politics. I'm a common sense leader who's always ready to listen, stay out of the political games, and find workable solutions that benefit District 20. Thank you, and thank you both. Um, we appreciate all your thoughts on these important issues that we covered. So like we said, we'll start with our closing comments now. Um, we each have one minute. So we'll start with Carrie. Politics can be so divisive these days, but that can't stop good people from stepping up and getting involved. Hyperpartisan smears are one of the biggest ways our system is broken. And when candidates engage in them with little or no proof, they only deteriorate the system even more. 
I'm focused on the future and the challenges that Johnson County families are facing right now. My opponent spends most of her time falsely attacking me for wanting to ban books, something I've never once advocated for. I'm focused, however, on the real problems impacting you right now. Record high inflation, crashing retirement portfolios, supply chain shortages, and reforming a broken system of government which far too often fails to achieve lasting results. Our future is what matters, and we need elected officials who are looking forward, not backward. I'm ready to focus my energy on issues like education, cost of living, and making Kansas a key destination for families and businesses to relocate so our economy grows and diversifies. That's what Kansans want, not shrill partisanship. Our, our district deserves someone who feels the urgency to advocate for real results and brings a level-headed, problem-solving approach to Topeka. I'm running for the Kansas House because we need far more solutions-oriented leaders and far less political demonizing and bickering. Like I said before, I'm a level-headed leader who's always ready to listen, stays out of the political games, and finds solutions that benefit and represent the people of District 20. So please vote for me, Carrie Rayfell, for House District 20. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Lynn, your turn to make a closing statement. Thank you again to the Johnson County Public Policy Council for coordinating today's forum, to the Overland Park Chamber for hosting, and to Mahler Hayes for moderating. It's been the honor of a lifetime to serve Kansas House District 20 for the last two years, hardly a political insider I ran for office in my mid-50s. I ran as the high energy champion for District 20 values, earned the support of voters across all party affiliations, then delivered results. I've been a Republican for 35 years and a Democrat for three. I'm less concerned with partisanship and like our governor, lead from the middle with constituent in input and tons of research. My bipartisan recommendations landed me the prestigious Build Fellowship for rising Midwest legislative leaders. I asked for an extra committee assignment to learn more about our state budget and made the ranking mem member was made the ranking member of it after my first year. I shepherded my bill to address teacher shortages to the finish line. I will fight to keep our medical decisions private and out of the hands of legislators. I've worked hard to deliver real results to you, and I'm ready to do so again next session. I'm Representative Mary Lynn Poskin, and I'm asking for your continued trust and confidence when you cast your vote this November. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both, Carrie and Mary Lynn, for coming today. appreciate your willingness to run and to be here today and to serve Johnson County. I want to thank all the chambers that make this happen, especially Overland Park hosting us. And a reminder to the audience that a recording of today's forum, along with other election information, will be on votejoco.com. Um, advanced work voting begins Saturday, October 22nd, if you can believe that, and election day is November 8th. Thanks for being here. <laughs>